اوكي اوه بلشنا اوكي زين فراح يكون بالانجلش لانه روني دازنت فيل ذات كومفورتبل ان عربيك هاو ذا هاو ذا موني وركس نو نو اتس ابوت ريتشينج اوت تو روحاني اند اتس ابوت تراينج تو ريستابلش ريليشن شيب وذ ايران وذاوت هزب الله از وي اندرستاند ات رايت ناو ذا بروبلم اوف هيز ارمنتس از اولويز ا بروبلم اي كان نوت جاست ديلي ذا هول social debate until this question might be solved especially if the answer is that we don't have an internal solution for this problem we should wait for a regional solution so this wait might remain for 100 years hmm. i in this meantime we have an internal problem with hezbollah and with other political parties how are you able to even remotely hypothesize any other group for killing my father you knew him you yeah. knew him professionally you yeah. didn't know him but you There's no other group that he was even in the crosshairs with other than Hezbollah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, فراح يكون بالانجلش لانه روني doesnt feel that comfortable in Arabic so hopefully بعد يومين ثلاثه اذا قدرت اعمل له ترانسليشن بالكابشن بيكون موجود بس مش من اول ما ينزل الفيديو so من جماعه الجي بنرجع على العربي or whatever language كيف بتساقي بالضيف انا راح يكون عندي مشكله بالانجلش اكثر منك اكيد I don't think so I'll do my best before we started recording it was just fine yeah now under pressure maybe exactly <laughs> So uh, we were talking before we just started re- recording about uh, you staying in the United States for some time. So what are the conditions for what are the conditions that led you to being raised and uh, had your first education in the United States before coming to Lebanon? Because it's a question: Why do you don't you speak Arabic that well? I'll answer but the question. But you understand Arabic. And oh, <laughs> I understand, and I'll answer. But I, I'd like to start by saying I'm honored. I think this is the medium that is necessary to talk through complicated issues. Yeah, I'm honored to have you on the show because uh, we lack people who can do uh, debate on serious stuff, maybe mm. from different standpoints, but in a relaxed manner. Absolutely. And as somebody who's a fellow podcaster with a much smaller audience than yours, I think this is the right way. Um, I think there's no healthier way to talk through an idea. And thank- thankfully, there's no commercials or there's no interruption. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, we'll get that. We'll get back to Even that. Even we had the yeah, labels. We'll <laughs> <laughs> we had the labels off. Being extra careful. What yeah. is this? Oh, it's black water. Yeah. <laughs> this is. Uh, we don't know what company that yeah. is. It's it's a good question and it's a simple answer. It's the civil war. Yeah. So my my family left in 1976 and I was born in 1981. So civil war. I grew up in the states. I was born in the states. Born in Texas. Yeah. And. Texas is not the ideal place to sort of study or remember your Lebanese Arabic. Unfortunately, I uh, I didn't have enough language training abroad. My mom tried, uh, my dad tried, but it didn't really stick. And I came back as a teenager, although I used to visit during the Civil War, but those visits were short. And I don't think they were just, they were not long enough to, to really sort of have the right ear mm. for the dialect yeah so i came late to the party and uh for better or worse i think that is that is why my arabic is bad yeah and i'm embarrassed sometimes to try and that's why I, uh, for better or worse i turn down events as well or occasions where you had so, to speak in arabic yeah because i mean i can easily confuse fishing with sovereignty i think it's <laughs> yeah, it was so i i you yeah, know yeah. I, i don't want to be talking about fishing rights on the corniche when it's yeah about, you know and sometimes people are judged on such stuff so yeah. uh, the idea might be good but the way you pronounce it might uh, just make people think that uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about and I think I'd actually a lot of people will turn off their <laughs> screens they would run away so I I keep it in English but uh, but leaving was because of the civil war and we came back and we moved back after the civil war ended so yeah. those 15 years I think were the only reason why I wasn't here yeah 
So, but when you're a kid, you do whatever your family does. You don't have much independent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for the people who don't know who Ronnie Shatah is, uh, you're a podcaster. You have uh, the Beirut Banyan. I'm a fan of that. And I like especially the uh, storytelling uh, qualities that you have. And you're the son of Hamad Shatah, the late uh, finance minister who got assassinated in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 13. 13. 13. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not something easy to digest for anyone else than the one who had this experience. One cannot imagine the the pain, the the, the whole uh, frustration, personal and in terms of your country and what to do next. So uh, I love the episode, uh, Nabad. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. It's really, that's a great episode in terms of storytelling and how to have deep and uh, closer look into the feelings, yeah. which is not easy to narrate usually. Uh, uh, if you can walk us through the experience itself and its repercussions on your thought. It's something that when, when it happens, you never go back to what it was like before. And I think if I have to look back at a marker where life fundamentally changed, I think it's the moment I saw his name on my phone. So I heard the explosion. Uh, and I used to live in Adli, yeah. so not close to Starco. But you know what it's like in Beirut when there's a massive explosion. The city, yeah, you yeah, hear yeah. it, and everyone in every neighborhood assumes it's nearby. I looked out the window. I thought construction uh, problem or... I, I heard the echo, but I didn't think right away that it was an assassination. Even though I lived very close to where Wissam al Hassan was killed, so I remember that explosion very well. Yeah. Um, I wasn't far away from Walid Aizu. The Aizu. explosion happened in Starco area. My father's is in, actually right behind Starco. Yeah. Um, but we all know what that sound yeah. is like. So I, I did not connect the dots right away. And especially that before this assassination, it has been some time. I think it was over a year. So a year and a half maybe because we Sam al Hassan. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. August 2012, yeah, so if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, around a year and a half. One year and a half. And that shows what this country is all about. You just said something which is very telling. Yeah. It wasn't that long. And we all are familiar. Familiar with such which occurrences. Is, yeah. So that, I heard the explosion. A friend of mine showed up. It's just ringing the intercom. It was a nine something in the morning, maybe 9.45 or 10. And just that panic buzzing on the intercom, I let her up, and she asked me if I had seen the news. I said no. I didn't really understand what she was referring to. And then she said, don't watch the news. Oof. Well, now I'm going to watch the news. You, know, yeah. you shouldn't say that. I'm going to watch the news. And I, she grabbed the remote and took it away, and I was like, oh, this is nice. This is serious. It's serious. I grabbed my phone. She grabbed my phone. She said, don't. I'm like... I can't. I have to look. And I actually left my apartment. I closed the door, which is a very stupid move because you shouldn't ever lock yeah. yourself out of your apartment. Yeah. <laughs> but I did. I, I let her in. I, I left the apartment. Without your phone? Without With my phone in hand. Oh, yeah. yeah. And she was inside trying to persuade me to not look. And I think it was within seconds. And that's the moment that changes everything. Yeah. So when you see something that's not... We all look at the news every day. We see names all the time. And we see names of victims all the time. And we see names of assassinated individuals all the time. But when it's your best friend, and when it's your when it's your father, it's not the same headline. It's it's something else. And I think that is where everything changed. Everything changed because I knew that. I knew what happened right away, and then I knew that things were going to be permanently difficult, and I tried to navigate it as as well as possible, but it was a very, 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 I mean, I think difficult is not even the right word. It's a scarring moment. Definitely. You know, uh, the, these kind of stories are the ones that one just uh, forgets. 
because uh, as you were saying, we got so familiar with having assassinations. And the, there was this word I used to hate, you know, uh, uh, so I felt there's without all, the other names, yeah, yeah because yeah. Uh, each one of these people has their own scar now yeah. and their yeah. own story. And even your story, are one of the stories that get left behind because now you're a relative, you're not the yeah person who's uh, assassinated sure so uh and people have short attention span yeah you you forget i don't blame anyone for that because that i think that's how you cope people yeah. just move on but i will say i'm glad you're mentioning this maybe the problem is that we cope we shouldn't cope that much accepting the abnormal is definitely a flaw oh. but the day it happened i went to his driver's home uh his driver was with him his driver was killed. They're buried next to each other in Martyrs Square. So I decided to go pay, just, just visit the family. That was more important to me than anything, yeah. was to actually go to the relatives of another person who died with him. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, I was interviewed by BBC uh, a few days later, and the journalist was in a way mentioning that, which is true, you can have an assassination in Beirut, and then you can have people dancing yeah. next to the assassination, or or not next to it, but you know, a few blocks away. No, I, uh, and that that to me is the story. It's that we've grown so used to political violence that you can, and we rationalize this yeah. as a good thing because I remember the next day. You know, I can't remember the exact day. Maybe it, it should have been close to the weekend. Mm. Because the next day, you know, music hall, it was, yeah, was exactly. around the block. Uh, right. I was there. Yeah. So uh, you had glass shattered all over the place. And right. people were walking on the glass yeah. to reach the nightclub. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, on most of our TV stations, they had reports in their nightly bulletin news saying that this is an example on how the Lebanese just love life and wouldn't just surrender to death this this is not an, uh, the best interpretation no we've grown to cope with everything uh, and we shouldn't just cope this this isn't how we portray our loving life that's not loving life it's because i think people lost control of their history and when terrible things happen regularly and there's an acceptance that you have no control over it, whether that's right or wrong. I think people simply move on. I totally agree. And within hours. Yeah, yeah. Which is, that to me is the striking part that it doesn't take a day or two. Now it takes hours. And I think this, this is terrain that has to be discussed. I think it's a taboo subject, usually. And I think a lot of people, well, I think there's a hesitancy to go too deep in what political violence did to this country. But in my opinion, that's where the conversation is. It's yeah. something that we still live with. Yeah. And we're, we're in 2021. Let's talk about this issue specifically because it's... Uh, that's my way of offering you a segue. Yeah, I yeah, it's I a good segue. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good segue because uh, one of my most frustrating issues to deal with in politics is, and sometimes you deal it with yourself, mm. but also with Lots of people in Lebanon who are just some good people and uh, with good intentions, but they have a deep belief that they don't have any influence on the uh, political course right. in Lebanon. So when you have people with this kind of belief, mm. you cannot ever change anything. Change should begin with a belief that change is possible, or else you will not make the first steps to Absolutely. reach that goal. So. In political violence also, it's the same issue. When you have this belief that this is the normal in Lebanon. Mm. So you are not mobilized in any way to just try to face a problem, to try to solve a problem, to just say that we have a problem and right. we can and should solve it. Or else this isn't a normal way to live our lives. Right. So this is my point of frustration. Yeah, I know that you accuse Hezbollah directly for the assassination of your father, and 
several other assassinations. How how is your political opinion shaped by uh, such problem that should be solved? So how do you approach this problem? I, I like the way you're asking it. I think that's actually a, an unusual but a healthier way of asking it. Uh, because I think one could remove the word. Remove Hezbollah. Because I think that word in itself brings up a lot of emotion. Yeah. I think it brings up, sometimes it brings up nostalgia. Um, I think there's a lot of glory involved. And it's decades. And it's one word that even if it changed fundamentally in the last four decades, three and a half decades, I think, I think the word itself causes more emotion than necessary. I will say that I fundamentally believe, and we can get into this as much as you'd like, it is impossible to reclaim your history when there is remnants of war still here. And when I say war, I don't mean necessarily uh, toy guns or uh, small battles that take place that we see regularly on the news. I mean strategic, regional posturing that today is Hezbollah. Go back to the 1970s. You asked earlier uh, why we left Lebanon from the civil war. You had militia fighting each other. Yeah. For a few years, Fatah was the main player, but Kate'ib was then a real competitor. And within years, you have militia killing each other. And that's, yeah. that's civil war. We have remnants of that today. And I think it's fair to say that Hezbollah is not the root cause of all problems. That is a fair assumption. I don't yeah. believe that. But I do believe that it is the main, main stumbling block today for ending what we got used to, which is now paralysis, it's collapse, political violence. I think they are the main contributing factor. And yes, I don't think any other group has the sophistication, the know-how, or even the intelligence necessary to pull off very, very, very dramatic car bombings in the middle of the city. So that is, to me, a major problem. The sensitivities are, are there, absolutely. In the 1990s, I, I remember the word Hezbollah did not bring up the same emotion that, or baggage that it does today. Yeah. It's a very, but it's a different time, and it's a different Hezbollah. So I think it's fair to acknowledge that there is an emotional reaction. And it's also, I think, fair to acknowledge that there's a major stumbling block right now. Yeah. That is Hezbollah. Uh, and can I add one more thing? Because yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to say something which I think is also important. I don't see it through a sectarian mm -hmm. lens. And that I mm -hmm. think is important. You can talk about a militia and what it does without even referencing a sect. And I think that is also critical to not make it even remotely sectarian. Even when Hezbollah or other players would prefer to keep it in the sectarian lexicon, yeah. I don't like that stuff because groups don't really impress me. Yeah. And group thought is not really where I stand. I'd rather come to the conclusion without those superficial ways of looking at it. Yeah. So uh, I, I see it as a sub-state group. I, I, I share, definitely I share the non-sectarian uh, angle. One of the biggest problems that we have in Lebanon, in, in my mind, is that, and it accumulates our problems and adds one problem to the other, is that we, we approach our political issues just to make a judgment. So let's give an example. So if one hates, let's say, confessionalism in Lebanon, it's easy to hate confessionalism or to just ask for a secular state. The question is how to reach from point A to point B. Mm. My problem with the Hasbollah question, because it's a question, we have two camps. The pro Hasbollah camp, you know, it's sacrosanct. You can't talk about it. It's, 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 it solves all our problems. It defends the country and everything. So there is no downside which is delusional. There's definitely a downside. It's a security matters and defending your country should be a point of stability for the country. Mm. When you have a power that defends your country, it should be the state. Mm. It's for this for the reason of having more stability. Yeah. When 
a non-state actor has the armaments, yes. while defending the state, you won't reach the stability that should be in parallel as a result of your action. So it's a problem. Yeah. We have a problem. We should acknowledge that we have a problem. Yeah. Not stating the accusation that might be true, that Hezbollah is inflicted in assassinations or anything else. On the other side, you have the people, I'm not replying on your answer because you're not one of them, that Hezbollah is a source of all problems. Mm -hmm. We cannot start even by building some blocks in this building that's called the state mm -hmm. without getting rid of this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have two opinions here. But neither of these opinions give solution what to do next. The first one, because they approve of Hezbollah as is, so they won't provide any solution. They don't see a problem to provide a solution. Right. The other camp sees a problem. So Hezbollah is a problem. And the elements of Hezbollah is a problem. What to do now to solve this problem? That's a, I like the question. And I, I, in a way, I'm lucky because well, there's two things. I think there was a recent conversation on Jadid if I'm not mistaken, or maybe even on your podcast, where you kind of elaborate on this issue as yeah, well. Yeah, a little bit on Jadid. Yeah. On Jadid, yeah. And uh, so th there, is a, there is definitely something there, and I'll get into that. But I will take one minor note. I don't think it might be true. It's true. Which one? The assassinations. Yeah. Now, I know that there's a lot of uh, hesitancy at acknowledging the special tribunal for Lebanon. I yeah. know that. I think it had a whimpering effect on many people, and it's been accused of so much for being a bloated, very long, unsatisfying process. But I think the answer is there. Yeah. And it's a thousand page report. Most people don't have the time to go into that. There's yeah. a summary. But all the reasons why a group like Hezbollah took those decisions and why it unfortunately did not end with my father. We now have Lukman Slim's assassination to be the most recent. So there's I, I take note with that. I take exception because because yeah. that even though I think you did it, I think you did it out of just being extra cautious. But it is true. So and I think we should give them that that they are that they are at least continuing assassinations long after the civil war ended. But I'll okay. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. try to to just have a point on this because I worked on the special tribunal for Lebanon for several years. It was one of my areas of specialty given the task from my tv yeah so my editorial board we all remember <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I have many problems with the special tribunal for lebanon uh, some of them are in the mainstream some of them are not in the mainstream one of which is like uh, i don't know how to tell it in english but so when, when you have a tribunal for someone who's not in person right so that was the exception from all international tribunals to accept this kind of uh, short uh, condition to accept the tribunal. It's one of the reasons that legally uh, those accused didn't have their fair share of trial. But I take that as, as uh, it's not the biggest uh, of problems I have with the special mm -hmm. tribunal. The biggest of problems that I have are two things. The first is that Juhud uh, Zur, I'm not sure what they are called in English, Muhammad Zuhair Sadi and the, yeah. uh, the whole lot. Yeah. So I'm not a legal um, uh, expert on this point, but I cannot understand how can you just uh, say hands off on this issue, it's not my specialty, when if they are in fact, and here also I'm not sure, if, but I'm pretty much sure because they go on TV and say some crazy stuff, especially Muhammad Zuhair Sadi. So when you have recordings of Muhammad Zuhair Sadiq or Saad al-Hariri or Saad al-Hassan or whomever else, and they contradict something else being said, and then the tribunal says that I'm not going to look into this matter, it's interesting for me because now if you take a look in this matter, it might, it's not, uh, there's no uh, definitive answer here, but it might lead you for the person who's trying to divert the uh, case to reach other goals. And the other thing that was, uh, it's a minor issue because I'm not an expert on the issue, but when I read the indictment at the, at the end or... The, the, the decision. came out. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the verdict, yes. The verdict, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. The verdict. Yeah. So, Salim Ayash, yeah. you have this uh, uh, beyond any reasonable doubt it should be in this clause, let's say. The problem is that his passport said that he was in Saudi Arabia, but 
they said that circumstantial evidence concerning the uh, uh, data collection that they had had the same pattern of movement of before him leaving Saudi Arabia. So this assumption led them to say that he didn't leave Lebanon. So it's circumstantial. So as an investigative journalist, which is yeah. what I think you're you're good at, and I'll say something else, as a storyteller, as a documentarian, as the, the Ziyad Rahbani piece, well, which was fantastic, thank you. I, I, I know that the sentiment that you're, the details that you're focusing in on, I th- and I'll take it one step back. All of these investigations should have been done in Lebanon. That's my whole point. And the reason they're not is because of Hezbollah. And that's my point. Okay. So I think that's where the that's where the line is, I think, because ideally you would want a state to be able to arrest Definitely. criminals. Yet this country, there's really one group today that is armed that you cannot go after in a security sense. And I think it's clear by now, I think, that it's not about criticizing this group, or it's not even about vehemently criticizing, or you can even go on TV and say whatever you want. I think it's about entering what a substate group does best, what a proxy group does, which is a security situation. The moment you enter that that network, I think you're on their radar. And that is why you have repeated assassinations in yeah. this country. It's not about a blog or, or, a, or a TV But sometimes appearance. there are some assassinations of people that... I'm not going back too far, but really since the Syrians decided... Yeah, yeah I'm talking about that, yeah, post-2005. Right. That's, if you remember uh, the MP Ghanim or yes, uh, yeah. even Walid Eidu, yeah. uh, they didn't have any direct connection to any area of the state that's related to uh, security. It's Maybe Muhammad Shatta had because uh, during the finance finance ministry you have uh, you have the uh, no no how no. the how, how the it's money works no no so it's about reaching out to Rouhani and it's about trying to reestablish relationship with Iran without Hezbollah as we understand it right now. Can That's you this, expand on this point? I, 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 his I, last first word, time I hear it. His yeah. last words we actually we shared his his missive to Rouhani which we shared uh, it was uh, I think it was two days after he was killed. And it appeared on the Wall Street Journal. It's still online, actually, to this day. I think you don't even need subscription to to see it. It's a letter to Rouhani, but it's an outreach to Iran at a time where many countries were reaching out to Iran. And and it sounds like uh, ancient time, uh, yeah. But eight years ago, seven years ago, Rouhani wasn't the president back then. He was. He was. He had he had more or less just entered the scene. And I mean, it's a different era, even though it's a short time ago. The UAE was reaching out to Rouhani. The Americans were really reaching out in a way that was unusual. And there was even a sort of hint that the Saudis would perhaps also do that. So Lebanon, in, in my, my father's mind, should take advantage of that opening to what was looking like a reformist situation in Iran. That That's the security line. That's when you get in the crosshairs, not of Rouhani, it's not about, or even Zarif recently sort of shared a bit about his yeah. own problems with the military, with the revolutionary count, um, revolutionary guards. It's when you touch on the military infrastructure that Iran established in any way, you're on their radar. And there are, I, I'll take the conversation back. I think these are the kinds of investigations you want an independent actor, an independent judiciary which Lebanon should have, to be able to arrest people that are causing this repeated situation. That said, um, I'll take it now one back, one one step back. Um, Going back to the initial point, which I, to a point, I do agree with you, that any situation in this country can bring an extreme reaction on both sides. I agree, and we've, we've all seen this before. Aoun does something, you'll have the base that says yes, and the opponents that say no. Hadith the same thing, Jumblat. I think anyone, maybe to different degrees depending on who they are, the reactions can be can be louder. But I don't think, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on yeah. this, I don't think the old division that we got used to, which more or less dominated our lives from 2005 until maybe 2008 or nine. I would say probably nine with the elections. I think the old pro-anti-Syria, or even if you want to say pro-anti-anything, the Arbatash with Tmeni line, I 
don't think it applies largely because the spirit, the ideas that were born out of March 14, 2005, not the, yeah, yeah. Not, the not the watered down sort of politics later, I think that was killed, that was murdered. My father is one example of that. So I, I don't think the two sides are there anymore. I think it's one side. I don't and agree on this point. I know, I know, but I'll, I'll tell I, you why. Yeah, and I, but I'll add one more thing because I want to. I, I know you don't, and that's why I kind yeah, of yeah. wanted to bring it up. Um, I think it's now a state that is either on its way to complete collapse with a sub-state group that can wither the storm, and that's one side. And I think everyone working in that situation is part of the problem. Yeah. The other, I think, and I'm going to take a sort of. I'm going to try my best here. I think it's the average citizen who just wants a normal country. Emotions aside, what you think about certain actors at certain times, that stuff aside, but I think the two cannot be reconciled because it's really either accepting that there cannot be something like Hezbollah today as it exists or accepting Hezbollah as it exists and trying to keep this thing going a bit longer and maybe it'll improve down the road. I think that's the... Uh, I'll go back to this point. Yeah. Uh, I hope I don't just go on a long rant here because I have this... Well, you have great uh, rants problem. on YouTube. You, <laughs> call, you. you call them rants. Yeah, yeah, I call them rants because uh, of lack of a better word. So some some people to tell me it's more like an editorial. Or, I, you, I'm I not sure. It was uh, Hamar... And something else, Mijrim, you tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no. That's one of the good yeah. rants I liked. You can't be a donkey only. Exactly. Uh, my take on the issue is first of all, yes, I, I'm a bit hesitant to just have a certainty hmm. on the perpetrator of the assassinations because I this word, beyond any reasonable doubt, doesn't, I don't have it personally. Here we can just have, but for the sake of argument, I'll just go one step forward because it doesn't matter. Because some people in Lebanon, and maybe they have all the right to so believe that Hezbollah is the perpetrator of these assassinations. So, could you, socially, could we have you, a problem. Could you? I'm going to interrupt you. I know I yeah. shouldn't do that because you were. I'm going to just take exception. I won't yeah, do it again. Yeah, yeah. Can you offer an alternative? To a group that can carry out something this sophisticated, I would say Israel. I would say the. Can you uh, accuse the Israel United of killing? States? I okay. would say the. Thank you, Mother. Give me any reason why Israel or the U.S. would kill my father. The, 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 there was the reason that Hezbollah and the Eighth of March camp used to say that these assassinations are to just give a boost, a political boost, to uh, a political camp that was. Failing politically, but that's the Hezbollah line. I know that's not yeah. your line. Yeah, definitely. I want, to, I want I want you to tell me if you can find any other group, even remotely able, to do something that like that. I would say Israel can, definitely Israel can. Not necessarily. Can. I think many countries can theoretically, but I'm trying. I'm talking in really in terms of a strategic threat to a group in this country that my father. Had any in any capacity. Let's let's take the example of Lukman Slim. That's why I said Lukman Slim can be killed by whomever. It can be Hezbollah, but it can be Israel. I cannot deny the possibility that Israel, because specifically because he was in this kind of conflict with Hezbollah. So if you want to have an internal uh, sectarian Shiite, but that's Hezbollah's line. I want to hear yeah. your. You, are you accepting no, no, Hezbollah's? I, I accept this. Uh, hypothesis. I, I'm not sure I'm if good, Hezbollah push. killed him, and I'm not sure if Israel killed him, because I don't have this certainty. Because I know that having such an opinion should have repercussion on my political view on how to deal with this problem. Because I have to be quite sure. Because saying that a, a, a Lebanese political party with a big social uh, approval is killing. Politicians in Lebanon, that should lead me to specific modes of action on how to defy this problem. Not, not Hezbollah, the political party. 
not the not them not even the not the social element of Hezbollah or even the 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 parts of Hezbollah that are probably less corrupt than other parties yeah. not not that Hezbollah that's the Hezbollah that actually I think that's the Hezbollah I think many people would want to see emerge the one that actually champions decent causes not that Hezbollah yeah. the militia there's no other militia there's just no other militia now say I I'll go with you can yes theoretically I think any country could pull off a major operation if it had remote interest in doing that my father had no enemies I believe that it doesn't he had mean no it, enemies you don't have to no but so you, you know, do the, you do if you're going to carry out a murder if you're going you to know, go the classical the classical uh, our JFK let's say the assassination of Bashir Ismail I'm going to um, I know I shouldn't do this because it's your podcast I should not be the one to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the problem I have as a podcaster I'm kind of <laughs> trying but I, I if with your permission feel at ease yeah I, I'd like to focus in on my father because you you yeah. eloquently brought him up and I trust your judgment as an investigative journalist yeah And as somebody, I think, who really wants a better outcome for this country. Otherwise, I, I, I mean, I, I believe that. So I want, I want to understand, how are you able to even remotely hypothesize any other group for killing my father? You knew him. You well, knew him professionally. Yeah, you didn't yeah. know him. But you, there's no other group that he was even in the crosshairs with other than Hezbollah. And I think... The reason why we didn't have an investigation into any of the assassinations, at least since 2005, is that there's one group that is able to make sure that doesn't happen. And add to that, I would love to see the criminals behind bars. I'm not on a, uh, it's not Game of Thrones. Yeah, 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 it's not yeah, like yeah. I want to sort of take the, dyna- uh, the whatever they are, these. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the big the families. Flying, the big, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or no, no, these crazy things that fly at dragons. dragons yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not about that. It's not folklore. It's it's real. It's real. I would want to see his criminals behind bars. Yeah. And I know that I can't see that happen. I know so long as there's something like Hezbollah. Mm. But when you're saying Israel or America, it makes me really uneasy because I don't have any possible explanation for why the Americans or Mossad or the Saudis or anybody would go after my father. He was trying Even to, the Israelis? to peacefully disarm, or at least find a, not disarm is the wrong word, trying to end a sub-state group's vast strategic chokehold on the country diplomatically. The Israelis, you're, you're in a way, you're, You're avoiding the Hezbollah accusation, I think, because you don't want to be seen as criticizing Hezbollah for their violence. And that kind of offers a neutrality, at least when it comes to presenting the case. I, I think that's what's happening. No, I, my, the, the, my problem is that from a journalistic standpoint, maybe our problem is that we come from different standpoints. His last tweet was minutes before he died, yeah. talking about how Hezbollah is in, inheriting the Syrian security apparatus. Yeah, but he's not the only one who has this belief and uh, they declare this belief from Ferris Said to many but, others. But he was doing something about it and that's what gets you killed. Yeah, maybe. So that's the part that I don't know. And you know better because uh, you have told me now about this piece that was published. From journalistic standpoint and from any... Uh, and the reason I'm going deeper yeah, into yeah, this yeah. and then I'm being unfair to you I know no, no, because it's I'm fine, pushing it's fine. is because I because really want to answers, hear it, it need yeah. to be to yeah. be answered from from my standpoint yes from my standpoint making the step towards uncertainty accusing Hezbollah that you are killing ministers you are you killed Muhammad Chattah is a step that needs to be proven from any source other than my own subjective or this is maybe a very well educated uh, analysis but, but it's an analysis when you say that in certainty I know that Hezbollah killed Muhammad Shabbat. 
I can't have this belief without any reasonable doubt because there are many uh, security apparatuses in Lebanon, especially uh, intelligence for many countries, and we know that in Lebanon, and it's not something new, that usually are not working, they usually work on what's called now the soft power, they don't work on hard power, they, but the Mossad was inflicted in many similar cases of assassinations that are not assassinations related to a specific political person, or a person that is just an enemy. But you need to trigger internal strife. And, and I'm not also here favoring this aspect. But that's but, Hezbollah's line. That's why I'm trying to get yeah, to but the Hezbollah's bottom. Yeah, but Hezbollah, Sorry. sometimes they, they might have good arguments. Sorry, I, I don't believe these arguments, but I keep them as hypotheses that I cannot approve of. So I don't say it's Israel, because I don't know. What I say is that I don't know. It might be. if Even if it's 2%, 3% possibility that it's not Hezbollah. If I make this mistake and say Hezbollah, I'm just making a political judgment that would entail uh, some positions that you need to... That's my I, question to you. And the, I will, I yeah, will then return yeah. to my own uh, but may I just way of ask, how, how dealing with Hezbollah. With the 90, let's say it's the 1%, one, one, 2%, 3% uh, chance that you're c carefully... Uh, not letting slip, right? Yeah. Because you're trying, you're you're trying to at least preserve that remote possibility. Yeah. Are you still able to think of any intention why any other group would carry this out? Acknowledging that one percent, two percent, I don't buy that Mossad stuff. It's not my. I'm not giving them any any credit here, uh -huh. but I simply don't buy it. And my father didn't have. He spent fifteen years abroad making the case for Lebanon's sovereignty under Syrian occupation and he was an ambassador for a few years in the States yeah. that was his line uh, he spent another roughly 15 years making the case for a peaceful way forward once the Syrians left that happened in 2005 and he returned he had problems politically with Hezbollah yeah, he Lebanon. had severe uh, The, the the fact that there's no other group that can pull off a car bombing in downtown Beirut next to Starco. Starco is not a remote corner in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. It's downtown. Like Hariri, like Marwan Ahmed, like many others. It's It takes a very sophisticated group with a lot of know-how and a lot of intelligence to pull off something that dramatic. And if you just, by elimination, think of only the opponents my father had there's no other group. Yeah. But you know what? It's a sticking point. I, I, I keep pushing. I, can, I cannot debate you on this point because yeah. uh, uh, it's your father and uh, it's an internal matter. It's, it's uh, in the house. So you've spoken to your father. You know his uh, fears. You know his problems. I, I cannot go there because you know b best on this. But issue. it fits into the pattern of crossing their sectarian, uh, cross, not sectarian, crossing their security paradigm. It's not the politics. If it was politics, I think it would just be endless debates. Some of it boring. No, but this this hypothesis, it's about crossing the security paradigm. This is it's, it's the reason that you're saying that it's the reason that Hezbollah would then put you on your radar. I think so, because journalists, from my understanding, or vocal critics, or some of them are very loud. Some of them are very aggressive. Yeah, but let's, let's talk about someone like Antoine Ghanim. Okay. Antoine Ghanim was a fairly... Um, he wasn't one of the most uh, MPs that we had who used to speak loud about anything. He and I would want reserved MP. absolutely. And I would want an investigation, actually. And even George Howe, he was back then uh, a little bit close to the 14th of March camp, but wasn't in the 14th of March camp. And he's from the Communist Party. Yes. Was, so not all of the narrative that was built around the assassinations I can approve of. That's why I need. A body, an independent body. It's the post post war disorder. It's the Syrian rule that turned into something else. It's less visible. We don't see it. And I, I think both of us would remember Al Hawaj is horn. Yeah, definitely. We don't have I mean it's not it's funny, it's not that long ago. Yeah. But we were stuck in a country that was we we didn't use the word occupation back then. 
Uh, we had I, I was uh, in the free patriotic movement back so, then, yeah. so I used to say it's op- uh, occupation. Right, and I think too many people were late to actually. But I was a small kid back then, so it's not a big deal. You know what, though, it's, that's the it's the looking back now, yeah. and I think no, it would be very hard to talk about it in any other way. I think it was an occupation, and there's no reason to even think otherwise. I think that's a fact. I think long term we will look back. And to the 15 years later, and describe it as it was, that this was a sub-state group that had political capital and also conducted assassinations. Okay, so my point here, uh, I will go back to my point later on, but I sure. want to ask and I'm you sorry, this question. I, I'm sorry. No, 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 I keep it's putting, fine, yeah, because yeah. Uh, one has to just, uh, uh, we have all the time, that's the, the advantage of a long format. As long as it's not six hours, because clubhouse... Yeah, yeah no, 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 <laughs> we won't go to the clubhouse <laughs> yeah. uh, times. Sunrise? Yeah, we'll be dead <laughs> by... <Back> <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know it's. I know I'm, we're funny when Ali is laughing too. That makes me happy. And there's an audience laughing at our jokes. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, my question to you: So you've made a point clearly, I guess, uh, on why you think Hasbala did it, and uh, uh, how do you just describe the whole political situation that we are in? So, my question to you is: If so. How do you suggest, politically speaking now, on dealing with this issue? That's the, that's the fair question. I think you even off, you in a way asked this in, in different ways before, and I think that is the question. Well, and I think it would be very foolish to come here and say, I have the answer, that mm-hmm. here it is in my wallet and I'll give it to you. It's a very, very, very difficult answer, and I don't know if I have the answer either. Mm-hmm. I will say, though, and we can get into this, I think... You know, October, November, and maybe even December 2019, I think that was something very, very special. Yeah. And I think it was special because it was my first encounter with domestic issues only. Yeah. There were no flags. There was no rooting for any other team. It was really just looking in and saying, we can fix our problems ourselves. That's special. Yeah. Before we started recording, and I, I agree with you, it's hard to give it a proper name because I think revolution, may, looking back in time, it may not be the right word, but it was a revolt at least. Definitely. And it was an uprising. Yeah. Maybe revolution brings with it a uh, certain emotion and maybe expectation. So it and could. I, I feel that revolution is a fait accompli. So, uh, right. So you, want, you would expect the change to happen. What's the end product? Yeah, there's right. no big change that happened. Exactly. But it was a massive uprising that swept the nation. And there were days, Jad, days that I was wandering around Martyrs Square with my microphone looking for people to talk to. Many of these people we know, they're fixtures on the politics yeah. scene. They were in Martyrs Square. And then silence because you were on TV. So it's almost like a, it's, it's Hollywood-esque. <laughs> Thousands of people chanting flags and then silence because you're talking and i saw you you would speak about me personally oh well i mean you're doing your show Uh, yeah and and we were i was mesmerized by the fact that you could have many people from different backgrounds different political background different ideas all tuning in and you're part of the story and we're all engaging in this moment together and i believed in that I thought, this is the way out. I don't think today that that's the case. Yeah. I think the answers, unfortunately, are not here. And the reason I say that is because it's not the first time Lebanese have tried to change things. It's actually happened too many times. Uh, I remember 2015, 2005 now is history, but yeah. it, was, it was also a very important moment. Yeah, definitely. And a very important figure like Michel Aoun came back, and that's... Jaja is out of jail. The Syrians are leaving. These are now we talk about these figures in ways yeah. that are toxic. We yeah. don't think of, but back then it wasn't the case. Uh-huh. And today, I don't think the answers are on the street. I think the the street tried. I think they tried very hard. I saw it myself. I think a lot of us witnessed what looked like something happening yeah. that didn't happen. I, I need to contest you on this sure. this issue. Uh, I'll begin from 
a step back. I believe the problem in Lebanon, now Hezbollah comp- uh, compiles on the problem, is another confessional party, but carrying weapons. So it's it's with the turbo charge. But the problem comes from way before. The civil war in Lebanon happened before Hezbollah, but then we had the end of a war, not in the best ways. We don't know why the war ended in 1990. The Syrians left us with this kind of regime, not only the Syrians, with Saudi Arabia and the United States, the, the whole status quo that remained until the invasion of Iraq, and then we had our problem. Mis- How, mismanaged by Syria, but yeah, we also part. We were part of the definitely. story. Yeah. So the one needs to ask him or herself, so how come this confessional system that we all acknowledge, even those in confessional parts acknowledge that brought us war and blood, brought us massacres, sustained itself for 40 and 50 years and even going back longer. Here is my own prognosis. So the problem is now that you cannot sustain a political system without uh, creating this uh, feeling of common sense, making people believe that the status quo, which is very specific and very particular for very particular uh, political reasons, Mm. Is not so. It's just common sense. Things just go that way. Mm. And that's why I uh, believe that our biggest problem is that people have no agency in Lebanon. Mm-hmm. So they, 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 they watch politics as if they're watching a football game. So they, they, they feel that they cannot influence the outcome. And that is the biggest problem brought to us by the regime. Our confessional regime has a specialization in manipulating fear, specifically with our memories going back to the civil war. Mm -hmm. So our fears are legitimate. Mm -hmm. They are not just uh, manipulating fears out of the blue. No, Mm -hmm. they are legitimate. We had the civil war, we had massacres, and they were confessional. The problem now is, my problem with the 14th of March moment and the 8th of March moment these two moments, both shared a common belief. They told us back then, and I was a demonstrator in the 14th of March back then, we believed it, really we did, that our problems come from abroad. Let the Syrians go. Even the 8th of March, it's the, to the other, other, yeah. other side of the coin. Right. So they were saying that it's Saudi Arabia, it's Israel. Our problems come from abroad or from the gulf or yeah yeah yeah. so i believe that the 17th of october movement or moment is a break with the 14th and 8th of march narratives or one narrative that came to say that we have many problems with abroad whichever this abroad may be but our main problem comes from within. This political system has the fruits of its own failure. And it's it gets aggravated by this abroad, by this other. But we have this problem internally. My fear, to just end this long sentence, is that, yes, the 8th and 14th of March internal camps got just scattered around and uh, we don't have these two blocks as they were. But we never had an internal 14th and 8th of March camps, just internally. They were a reflection of a foreign policy, quote-unquote, position. Were you in the Mu'tadilin camp mm-hmm. or Mumena yeah. camp? Yeah, yeah. So now, the same line still divides the different political parties. They have many problems now with the regime that has collapsed. They are just picking on each other, who's to blame. But on regional issues, they fall in line again. My fear is that going at Hezbollah, because I'm all for Killun, Yani Killun. Hezbollah is one of them amongst this political class that is sustaining a sectarian system that is just moving on on our bodies. Mm. I believe that. My problem is that Picking on Hezbollah from his armaments before having a state project, not a state, a project for a state to 
pick on Hezbollah and debate Hezbollah on its on his on this party's internal program. What can Hezbollah answer me on the currency rate, on our monetary status, uh, be it my salary, be it the economic problem, be it the independent judiciary, being corruption in Lebanon. On these issues, Hezbollah doesn't have an answer, until now at least. And none of the sectarian parties have an answer. And the, the reason is quite clear for me. Confessional parties are vertical social camps. They c- cannot answer on mm. horizontal problems like how should we distribute the losses? Because these losses would cut their parties uh, let's say, class-wise. So this problem, Hezbollah is more vulnerable to and more, I feel, urgent to answer on because the problem of his armaments is always a problem. I cannot just delay the whole social debate until this question might be solved, especially if the answer is that we don't have an internal solution for this problem, we should wait for a regional solution. So this wait might remain for 100 years. Hmm. I, in this meantime, we have an internal problem with Hezbollah and with other political parties. My own solution is to debate Hezbollah on what state are you I'm too old, are you promising your own fighters, your own uh, adherents, for their sacrifices to be worth a, a country that is worth living in. Because if you don't have a, a, a state project, then the resistance is a, an end in itself. It's not a means to an end in having a better state or a better living as a society. That's my whole problem. Maybe it's, it's too long. No, I'll, I'll say one thing. I wish I had a notepad. I, <laughs> there's have many, many things so to much, and you're going to have to help me remember everything because I there's a few points we'll I... Go through and through. We, yeah. As long as I don't miss the central point in any in any case. I, 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 I like the way you're laying it out. And... I will, I will try to elaborate where I disagree, at least in terms of maybe it's the foundation. Maybe it's the honing in as opposed to exploring everything that happened. Yeah. And I'll elaborate here. Let me go back to the initial part of the, of the thread. I, I don't, and we said this earlier, we're both fans of Fawaz Trabulsi, and his book is here, History yeah. of Modern Lebanon. We both admire him. Yeah, and by the way, thank you for shooting the first episode at my home. <laughs> Usually, I go to. Oh, to, really? Yeah, it's the first interview I have here. So, I, do I get uh, compensation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about I, this compensation. No, I, but yeah, <laughs> more of this, maybe. <laughs> I get water. Yeah. <laughs> that should be actually a nice uh, sponsored by <laughs> yeah. Come to Kasli, you can drink water. Yeah, we're we're both fans of of him. Um, you had the privilege of including him on your podcast. Yeah. And I think there's no doubting the the massive research that was done to produce something like that book. It's not an easy book to read, but it's it's full with information, as was Samir Asir's Tariq, uh, yeah. Tariq Beirut. And Kamel Salib is a house of many mansions. There's, there's a lot of, uh, there's rich material to go yeah. back to. I'll acknowledge that we have a very, very old, outdated, strange way of governing it's not fit maybe for the 21st century it's a strange way of sort of having consensus along confessional lines it probably worked at some point because lebanon was not always hell um maybe it was not always admired by everyone in the country it always had its disadvantages and you cannot you have to maybe even acknowledge that even in the best years of modern Lebanese history, there were many that suffered. Yeah. It's not shining no, all no, the time. No, no, I had some uh, dark days. Sure. And the dark days for some could be the 1950s. Yeah. But for others, it's not that it could be the 80s. And maybe for us now, we're living our darkest Hard days. Is, yeah. But I take issue with blaming confessionalism for the war. I don't think sectarianism the way we understand it now this very ugly pejorative word which is part of our dna to a degree 
I don't think that is the reason why people killed each other. I think sectarianism may be like a supermarket sometimes, where you just go and you pick and choose the items that best reflect what you're looking for. Yeah. And the reason I say this is because, to me, somebody who did not live in the 1970s, but now has spent years and years trying to explore what a state breakdown looks like and why states collapse and why violence reigns in a very quick period of time. In our case, it's really a few years that it went from yeah. an, a, an outdated model, but one that worked, to complete chaos. But maybe the problem isn't confessionalism in itself. It's the impotence of the state. The state should break down any military movement against itself or between its social components. Right. And I, Confessionalism yes. led to the impotence of the state, but the impotence of the state is our problem and remains our problem. So I'll, I'll clarify. Yeah. I, I think countries go through nightmares when you have components that are beyond the state's control. Yeah. And that's why I think 1970 is where the problems begin. Not the economic problems. The economic problems are old. Not the confessional structure. That is very old. It's the political violence yeah. that, that made us, in a way, unable to chart our destiny. That's 1970. Yeah. That's when a foreign... It's when a militia enters the country that is not under Lebanon's control. Now, I know Fatah and Hezbollah are not the same. I know al kataib Fatah and Hezbollah, they're not the same militia. Every other, Morabitun, yeah, yeah. the Syrian occupation is not the same as Hezbollah, or for that matter, every political violence era in this country. It's not the same. But, but, yeah. sub-state group Lyon that resembles that era is the same. Meaning, there's, me there's another resemblance. It's the same now as back then. Yes. The state allowed and didn't confront the bringing of another armed political faction. Hezbollah came during the civil war, so it was a different case. But during the late 60s, early 70s, the Palestinians, uh, Palestinian presence in Lebanon was getting militarized and moving. The state had many op opportunities to make a move, and it didn't. For better or for worse, I know in Lebanon we still have the memories, some are on this camp. For better or for worse, states are not always something that you would be uh, approve of. Appro mm -hmm. You would approve of. Yeah. There are, we were speaking about Saudi Arabia for me, and even Iran, and these kind of regimes I don't approve of. Right. But they are there. They yeah. do. They have functions. Right. Our state is always impotent. And I believe the reason for this impotence is it's invasion from confessions. I think that that conversation is one that is being had all the time now, which is yeah. good. Because some, I think it's almost like you can say uh, the state is by default a failed state simply because of the way it's put together, with or without a militia. Yeah. And then you can take the other road and say, militia bring militia. And that's how countries collapse. Yeah. I think it's a nuanced debate. But I also think that if you want to address the other problems, you know, there's a great conversation you had on, I hope I remember this right, it's on Al Jadid, where you said, what about the potholes? What about the minor issues? Yeah. Fix those and then go to Hezbollah's weapons. Or at least you're taking the Hezbollah in a way you're saying, how can you persuade a group to disarm when the state doesn't exist? Who do you give I'm, your arms? I'm trying to, and yeah. this is the whole video that uh, was taken out of context, and to say that I'm for Hezbollah ruling the country. Is it this, oh, it's the same one. I'm <laughs> no, sorry. No, it's, no. It's, I believe it's the same logic because I, it's not the first time that I uh, mm. speak in, this, in these terms. Right. Now, for some reason, it took this, maybe because the wording, mm. No, but I meant it more in the... In the uh, but in, my point mm. was, in order to... Try to have a conversation like the one that we have, we, we're having, but with the adherence of Hezbollah, with the population that says that Hezbollah is doing everything for the good of the country. Right, How can right. you uh, launch a dialogue without starting to understand the reasons of legitimacy 
that Hasbollah's armaments have in the eyes of their followers. And here I say that you need to have some legitimacy for the state, for it to be able to ask, so give me your arms and I will handle defending the country. I think most Lebanese, including Hezbollah supporters, are tired and they don't want this situation. Yeah. And I think Hezbollah is the way it exists today because Hezbollah is a regional problem. It's not a Lebanese problem. It's a regional army. And I think also that, and tying it in a bit, I think Lebanon is now defined by corruption and violence and, and anarchy to a point. Yeah. The worst traits rather than what it should be. Oh, yeah. And I think it's okay, in fact, it's maybe necessary to disagree with whether it's 8% of the population or 80% that a paramilitary force is a problem. Whether or not asking or trying to find a constructive way for Hezbollah's weapons to be incorporated into the army or have Hezbollah as part of the army one day, whether that, whether that conversation is happening before or after reform requests, I think is not the story. And the reason I say that is, I want a state that does not represent the direct and indirect consequences of political violence. To me, every single individual we complain about in this country, and I think all of them today, perhaps over decades now, are part of the story. They've been largely preserved as individuals that are really trying to, in a way, preserve the status quo. That's a status quo on Hezbollah's terms today. I, I, I agree on the uh, how you portray the state that we want to build, especially not one directly or indirectly influenced by uh, violence. Right, and I think, and we went back a little... But my question is yeah. how? I, I don't have any problem with, yes. the, with the end result. You're going to probably hate me for yeah. offering an idea. Yeah. And you can... Let's see. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope this brings you more viewers, not uh, less. No Let's problem. See, you show me later. Yeah. I think it's a word that's abused, and I think it's a word that's treated unfairly. But I think a Lebanon that's disassociated from all conflicts in the region is the Lebanon I think all of us need. How can we reach this Lebanon? That is the question. And I think you asked it in a way earlier. I really, I believe in the, and I believed in October 17 as I saw it. And I think it's the same October 17 you yeah, saw yeah. and all of us saw. And I saw it die. Not the groups that are that are trying to emerge or emerging or campaigning later. Not those. Not every decent citizen that is still yearning. If it's not on the street, it's online. Not the demands that were left unfulfilled. I mean it in terms of political authority. I think all of these groups will face the same wall that was met earlier. It's a wall that you can't confront. It's a wall you can't hold to account. That wall today is Hezbollah. And I just don't see it happening. I, I agree that Hezbollah is a big problem uh, in terms of its, in my view, of its legitimizing the impotent state once again and shielding all other sectarian powers from the moment of 17th October and on because Hezbollah was the last strong party in Lebanon that withheld the power of the demonstrators, and the power of the economic collapse. Mm -hmm. Here, I agree, my problem is that Hezbollah isn't alone. Hezbollah is one out of many, but it's alone in carrying out weapons. If one wants to have any hope to reach a peaceful solution to this problem, because we both share one, maybe it's the biggest and most important uh, uh, fear that we shouldn't go back to violence because that's the biggest fear. And maybe that's why I cannot go to the certainty that Hezbollah is the responsible of the assassinations. That's interesting that you're saying this. I'm glad because, you're saying this. So, so it's out of fear for acknowledging the violence that has been happening. It's because of if you acknowledge something out of pure analysis, not pure analysis, you have a well-educated analysis, not a fact that you can 
mobilize the whole society based on an independent judiciary that came out with this solution, you are saying one out of two things. But it's out of fear of, of what could happen. I like that you said this right now. Yeah, both. If I take the argument of those who say Hasbullah is doing the assassinations, they, they have one out of two options. You cannot sit with these people, neither in parliament or in government, because you're legitimizing a party that is killing people. And you cannot have any dialogue because it's not it's out of the political realm to have dialogues with people who are committing political crimes. But yeah. this is this is a point we can agree to, and I think you have either to fight them or wait until a foreign power fight them. I think the the cause if one exists in terms of trying to pacify this country from problems, is disassociation. I, the word neutrality has been used in a sloppy way in Lebanon, I think. It's not the role of a patriarch, or it's not the role of, uh, of religion. No, I agree, it's the role of us, Shad. We should be the ones saying it rather than leaving other people that should not be even taking a role in it. And I'll say one more thing. Yeah. I know I'm, you're very nice to let me even interrupt no, you. No, no, relax. I... I I know it's a word that brings up the Israeli-Palestinian cause right away. The moment you say neutrality, what about the Palestinian cause? I think that's the first thing that comes up. And then there's a sort of slippery slope into every other cause. What is your take on it? It's not that. You can take a position on a cause. You don't want that cause to bring violence to Lebanon. That's the issue. And I think Hasbullah, the it's way... Not, it's not the same issue. When when we, when I had the debate with Diana Elid, uh, and she was so kind to also sit down for about two hours debating on these issues. That that Actually, that conversation is what motivated me to, to do this. Uh, is that, uh, I, I like the tone. Thank you. I really like that tone. And uh, uh, I like Diana so much for, for her tone because yes. it's usually you would have the... the, the, the you would be... Uh, to say it in how to say it in English. Like, yeah, 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 being uh, treated as a traitor to, to the yeah, cause or yeah, whatever. Yeah. So uh, the the issue is that if I say and it can apply to Muhammad Shatah, but it was the case of Luqman Slim. If I say that Hasbullah, I'm I'm sure that Hasbullah assassinated Luqman Slim. There are some uh, let's say evidence. I don't know what to call it. Uh, conjunctures that might just lead you to say that Hezbollah might have done this. But can you be strictly and purely sure that Israel did not do it or any other power for that reason? If I am not sure, how can I as a journalist go on air and just speak on such issues as if I have the truth on the matter. I don't have the truth on you the matter. You will not get that truth that you're looking for. The truth you're looking for exists in countries that have a functioning state with a functioning judiciary. That's, that's my whole point. And that's, that's the, the state that I'm fighting to have. And I think the state that you're fighting to have is the same state I'm fighting to have. In, in its essence, I think it's the same one. But I think there's this... It's, it's for Maybe it's for your own standards, maybe. Or maybe it's for other reasons, too. That inadvertently shielding Hezbollah from that criticism, I think prolongs that issue. And I, I think it's central to the story. And yeah, that's it, why I'm not for shielding Hezbollah from that criticism. Mm, yeah. That's why I say Hezbollah might have done, done it. That's enough to, for me to say that we have a problem here. If, if there is a, a possibility, and when we're talking about have the Lebanese, more, more or less. That's I, think I think that it's a possibility. I think the word Hezbollah, I think that's the issue. It's because we, I think it's a complicated word. If we were literally able to, to find a way to describe a militia as it is, that is preserving its security infrastructure, which I think is what... But, but here, here also, that closes uh, some doors on, on debating, not with me personally, but if you want to debate on this issue with some adherence to Hezbollah. Those who are open for debate, you know, in each party you have those who are open on debate, those who are closed on any debate. When you say that, when you see only the problems that Hezbollah has, and it has many problems, you are 
having a blind eye on the reasons why some people adhere to this party. Not all people are uh, uh, like the victims of clientelism or they had some money or they had some... Sure, yeah. Some people lived in the South, let's say, exactly. and faced Israel and the Absolutely. state didn't defend them. Absolutely. Hezbollah did. And Hezbollah succeeded, not as a state, to as much as a, uh, what to say, military entity, and I non- State think, entity can succeed. I think it's because this is the same word that changed. In the 1990s, my relationship to Hezbollah is fundamentally different. You go to the south and you're celebrating what was a very important achievement. The Israelis left. You can get into endless debates on exactly why the Israelis left at a certain time in May of 2000. Mm. But the fact is, they left and Lebanon with all of its division, and all of its complications, there was a moment where people said, finally, the Israelis are gone. And I thought of Hezbollah in that realm. Many people were impacted by Hezbollah before. Many people have died in this country because of many militia. You go back to the civil war, it's bloody, it's messy. Mm. And I really think it's because we're still using the same word to describe something that is very different today. It's not the same Hezbollah. It's not the same machine. And if anything, and I'll take it all the way here, I think the reason why we're stuck in this situation where Lebanese, for the most part, are endlessly debating Hezbollah today in ways that are unusual. I think any uh, clubhouse room, any tweet, any, any podcast, you can't but talk about Hezbollah. I think it's because Hezbollah may be more important to Iran than we appreciate. And, and I say this because it's not doing Lebanon's bidding. It may actually be the survivability of a military regime. And Iran's regime is increasingly military rather than Rouhani. Yeah. I think Hezbollah is crucial to Iran. It's strange that Iran is happening now or it's been happening the last few days. My they're, problem, they're talking to Americans about nuclear technology. Yeah. Very strange conversations that can happen on very sensitive sites. But they're unwilling to discuss Hezbollah. They're unwilling. Uh, my, my problem with, the, with this narrative, not the politics, not the po- not the political. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm talking I'm about going a step yeah, back. Yeah. Uh, if one has a problem with Hezbollah, and I put this problem on the table because one has to deal with it, if you agree on it or don't, mm. uh, it's funny how uh, it's important to have your own take on Hezbollah. If you put yourself in the position of uh, uh, a ruling position in the state, let's say. Uh, you're the next prime minister. And you have to deal with a problem like Hezbollah or a minister or whatever. You have to deal with the very strange next prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the Multiple new look. problems. That's the post 17th of October look. Or Lebanon. <laughs> no, I, I'll surrender right away. <laughs> so my problem is that if I get into the Hezbollah question solely, not in the lens that I believe one should tackle the Hezbollah question as of most of other parties' questions, but Hezbollah, and specifically, specifically, on internal social issues and how to deal with the state. Because, because if you don't do that, once again, with the same tools of the 14th of 8th of March, it's, it's not important if we still have the camps. With the same tools, if we polarize society on an issue without giving them any agency to affect this issue. If we tell them that Hezbollah is a problem because it carries arms, which is true, and you can't do anything about it, we should wait until the region carries any problem or any international solution. And they know that these solutions usually don't come into white or black solutions. Usually there's some continuity in, in mm-hmm. politics. Yeah. Look at the civil war, how it ended. Sure. Look at the Syrians, how they left us. Absolutely. So this continuity. So you are leaving people with no agency on affecting their own destiny. And that will lead them to despair, which is everywhere in Lebanon now. And while at the same time, this feeling of despair This polarization between two camps on a regional issue feeds into the narrative that would regain their constituency with some legitimacy on their roles. Because they tell you now, 
you see that we are on a big and regional fight. Either you're on Hezbollah's camp or anti-Hezbollah's camp. It's the same language. We have to fight this fight as a priority. All the other issues with your salaries, with your incomes, with your deposits in banks, with the uh, uh, public debt, with the state that is collapsing, with our mode of living that we are losing each and every day, this should wait because we have bigger issues. There's two I words. cannot give such uh, rhetoric any legitimacy. I believe it is it's crashing us, as Hasni Mubarak or Assad used to say to its population to legitimize its dictatorship, that we have a bigger issue with Israel or whatever. You said two words that resonate with me, and there's a third word that we haven't used, and I think maybe it's the time to use it. Agency and destiny. I completely agree. You want a population to have its agency and its destiny, or at least its. you want its destiny to be brighter rather than darker. Mm-hmm. And you want control. You want to hold your leader's account. You want, the most, you want the brightest and most talented to shine. And one day you want them in parliament. You want them in Ba'abda with Sarai. You want them in places that they're not, they're not there. No. Instead, they're leaving. And I think probably between us, we have too many common friends that are on their way out or have left. Definitely. Or are living in the situation you eloquently described, one of despair. The word is sovereignty. Sovereignty matters. Sovereignty is what Lebanon lost 51 years ago. I think we've been struggling in the mud since. We've had periods of intense, brutal war. We've had invasions, multiple Israeli invasions. We've had occupation. But maybe we are not acknowledging that we cannot have sovereignty unless we have a prerequisite for that state. So I will take, I, yes, you're right, and we'll go in the same road together. It's a nice way of wrapping it up. Maybe it's almost like <laughs> Jad and Roni are now <laughs> on the same road in traffic. Sovereignty, getting your institutions and your army as the authority, no other actor can determine what is right or wrong in terms of a state's policy or even can determine what war and peace looks like. I think that's the state that we lost. Why we lost it in the 1960s, there's a conversation there. Economic pain contributed probably to the insecurities of people back then. I don't think it's what contributed to the breakdown of Lebanon. Yeah, back then it, it was a whole different issue. Right, and I think that we cannot imagine a Lebanon that goes back into those years where it's one authority, I think is part of the problem. That's the Lebanon. I think you need to go back to it. Not not in the I insecurities. Want to wrap it up with a question. But can I just say one yeah, more thing? Yeah. Within, yeah. Sure. It's not dismissing everything that happened before. It's not dismissing even the violence before. Lebanon had a civil war in 1958. Lebanon had Lebanon has had assassinations since 1916. This episode will come out on Eid al-Shahada. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's 105 years ago. Yeah. Pro, uh, journalists and politicians are hanged in Martyr Square by Jamal Pasha. Yeah. That's a long time ago. So assassinations are not new. It's not one group. That's clear. But I want to go back to an independent country that we lost in 1969. And I think that prerequisite is a state that we can hold to account. Your question is valid. How do you do that given that there is a very complicated regional issue in Lebanon? That's the question of our time. Yeah. And I, think, I believe the yeah. state is the playground. I believe even your father fought his fight because you said that he was trying diplomatically to achieve his goal, which is all fun by me because any goal reached out diplomatically cannot or should not end up as it end, end up for him. But he was carrying his fight through the state. The state is a playground where it's, it's created as an entity for the sole purpose of peacefully resolving conflict. Absolutely. Because no one would like a state. It tackles down on your freedoms. It takes from taxes. We only need it for that purpose. If our state has no political players who come and fill this, these pos- pos- positions in the state with a plan. And that's my big criticism of the 14th of March camp now for the 15 years that have passed, and even the 8th of March in different ways. But the 14th of March, because they called for the 
disarmament of Hezbollah. They haven't once had a plan to arm the army. They didn't have a, one plan to get it in their budgets to have a defense plan for the people or even any any other facets of state legitimacy, let's say having a, a yearly budget, uh, being truly fighting corruption, not having tahasus, uh, muhasasa. So they, they, they had a behavior in power that didn't really enforce the idea of that's how we strengthen a state while asking for Hezbollah to disarm Shad. for us to have a state. Uh, was it 13 years ago that we both saw what happens when you remove one person from one position, Bil Matar, or you even question what the telecoms networks okay. should if, look like? If and that's have, the fight. You have then what this forced, ugly thing that we both probably hate, national unity. You're forced to paralyze. Yeah. But and that's that's political violence. That's exactly that's an example. So if now you have let's say hundreds or thousands of people who um, say each and every possible word about Hezbollah, and you don't see any reaction, but when the state carries any action, someone has to react because the state is something real. It's not just an opinion said whatever. The state, if you want to carry any real change in the country, it should be through the state. Absolutely, yeah. Saying that it's a regional issue reshapes the state as an impotent body unable to solve any problem. Oh, oh I understand. So no, no, I, I, my, yes, I understand your point. So if what I'm saying yes, that yeah, yeah. if you want to tackle the Hezbollah problem, you should carry it from a state standpoint. I agree if Hezbollah was a local militia only, because then it would have probably been part of our history, like every other militia. You know, we both remember very, very fierce militia. Until you grew up during the worst years of Lebanon's history, we both know what it was. We remember to different degrees what it's like for the Uwet to be armed. Yeah. Not a small party represented by a former warlord. We remember the militia. I remember checkpoints that you didn't necessarily know who was monitoring them, sometimes really afraid. But all of those have been more or less disarmed to various degrees over time. The ones that are technically armed today have toy guns compared to Hezbollah, mm. their toy guns. That's the kind of situation I think you could have, and I agree with you, the focus should be on Lebanon. But Hezbollah is not only a Lebanese group today, it is an army. But this whole building, I'm, I'm just, for the sake of argument, I'll take everything and just try to uh, lay the argument to say, this argument, where does it, what does it feed? Even if Hezbollah is a regional power now, and it is, this whole building is built on specific legs, and I don't know, Awamid Asis, yes. on very... Uh, I like yours more than the actual translation. Yeah, yeah. Specific <laughs> legs. It's yeah, actually yeah. quite nice. <laughs> My English is trying. Uh, no, no, trying. that was actually yeah. it's better than the real thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. So these legs are, it's popular approval. If Hezbollah faces a community that isn't in any way, shape or form really majoritarian in its support it cannot carry this whole building it will just crumble I'm, I'm calling on Hezbollah when I said I want Hezbollah to rule because the whole context was that Hezbollah cannot rule because it's a confessional party and the confessional party cannot have a solution for this whole society because it sees society as a fragmented entities that it only has the responsibility on a side of it, not the whole society. So if Hezbollah is challenged to rule, which is not doing officially, some people say Hezbollah is ruling everything. I don't believe that because Hezbollah is the most powerful entity in Lebanon without any question. But this most powerful entity has a big problem in a confession system that it will carry the load of responsibility on everything that's happening but not ruling on its own that's why Hezbollah from the 70th October until now wants Saad al-Hariri as prime minister yes. which is baffling so I'll say two things here I'll add to it actually because I, I agree with you 
Hezbollah doesn't want two things in particular. It doesn't want civil war. It's a civil war that they can't they can't manage, and it's a Lebanon that they can't control. And they don't want to govern. They want a sub-state situation that they've achieved, largely through violence and in different ways too. And some of it is popular opinion, popular persuasion too. They don't want those two things. And that's why you'll never see a Hezbollah government. In other words, the way you're describing it, I don't think that'll ever happen. That's why I challenge Hezbollah on this issue but that's, because I call for the, the root cause of our problem that we don't have uh, a potent state and the potent state cannot exist in Lebanon if we don't have a secular system. That's but, but the, the problem of Hezbollah. That's why I have a big problem with Hezbollah. But, but the reason also you don't have a Hezbollah the way you're just the way you want it, which is I think you want a political party to be held to account. But that's not the Hezbollah that we live with. And also also the reason I think we don't have armed opposition to Hezbollah, which led the country to war in the 1970s, where you have Kate'ib fighters training yeah. while the Lebanese army doesn't do anything. And you described it exactly as it happened. I think the reason you don't have a direct threat to Hezbollah is because of Hezbollah. So they've actually managed to circumvent the state by not governing it. They've managed to, in a way, preserve a status quo that most of us hate today and something you said which i fully agree the most popular christian politician not maronite christian yeah. michel own people cursed him people curse him all the time people say things about him he's probably still the most popular christian figure in lebanon hezbollah supporter saad hariri people are consistently disappointed with this person as far back as i can remember people are criticizing him they criticize his father. He's criticized, I think, tooth and nail right now yeah. online. I've, it's almost second by second. He's Hezbollah's preferred prime minister, as you exactly described. And Nabi Hibri, the alternative. And Walid Jumblat. And Walid Jumblat, who maybe says things and then acts in different ways. And, and Samir Jaja, who left government just a year ago. So that's my exact case, which is I want a system that can be held to account without the worst forms of violence keeping it together. And I think I think in that conversation, there's more agreement than disagreement. Yeah, I totally agree. And th there's there's the opening of, th this is how, how I understand killun yani killun. They all are sharing a, a, a system, each for his own definition of benefit. So sometimes, out of a losing perspective, Regionally, Saad Hariri had to accept stuff that he didn't want to, Absolutely. but he did accept. And and own to <gasps> and own to yeah. and Samir Jaja. Yeah. But they did accept. They tried to portray the, their acceptance of the status quo as their only option. Right. It wasn't their only option. But you know what? That's the ugly thing about national unity. That's not national or unifying. It's a forced paralysis where everyone Definitely. is forced to sit together and just watch the ship collapse and veto each other and veto each other and i think a lebanon that we can both reimagine without regional battles and you said the the battlefield or uh the playground the playground for war the country has been a battlefield and a playground for decades i'd like to live in a lebanon that's not like that i totally one agree. that doesn't care if there's a conflict in Iran and Saudi Arabia, or for that matter, every single issue that happens in the neighborhood, Lebanon has to be involved. I'd rather live in a Lebanon. I, I hope that people, uh, uh, and it's it's a personal struggle. It's not something that I can just call on people. I, I'm calling on myself also to just remain a believer that we have the power to affect, not to change everything the way we dream to, because that would put us on a spot that would make anything less than our expectation unacceptable. Mm. No, but we can influence. I, I see democracy not as it is written in our school books. Uh, democracy isn't the uh, people governing themselves. No, that's, that's a romantic story. Demo democracy, in fact, is in opposition of a autocracy where one center mm. influences and rules mm -hmm government mm -hmm. it's one center mm -hmm. it's the ruler and his family or whatever yeah in democracy you have several centers of influence you have the 
actual ruler, the prime minister, let's say, or the president of the republic. You have the uh, financial elite. Mm -hmm. You have the uh, human rights uh, and NGOs, uh, groups. And you have many other factions. What's missing in Lebanon is the popular center that will never rule on its own the country, neglecting all other centers of influence. But it will influence power. Now, people are not influencing power to a degree where after a year and a half of our biggest collapse in the history of our republic, the same players that made this whole collapse possible in this dramatic way are taking their time, eight months, to form a government on the same reasons of paralysis before that they forced before the collapse. That's how inefficient the population is as a center of influence. I would like to reclaim that center. Absolutely. And I think, although I don't want to end it on a disagreement necessarily, but I'll just, I'll suggest it. I think all of this are the blurred consequences of war. And I'll, something we didn't talk about. It's maybe unrelated to what we we discussed, but there's no reason why Lebanon should have 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate in its port. Definitely. No reason. And only one obvious conclusion can be brought about is that Lebanon is still the battlefield. That's the problem. A city that was scarred, and I I said this in different outlets, it's a city that was assassinated. It's the neighborhoods of Beirut that are unrecognizable. That's because of war. It's not... Corruption is what lets ammonium nitrate stick around longer than it should mismanagement and mis and bad supervision is what keeps it stored in a very toxic way but it's not the reason why it's there and that's part of war and i'd love to live in a lebanon uh, the, the problem here is that i always go uh, one step back maybe and the reason of war is the absence of the state that should eliminate the possibility of war so we're actually agreeing on that on that issue yeah yeah i, yeah. I do believe that yeah and maybe uh, just to wrap up, I would like to maybe I'll be your guest next time. To just, uh, uh, but you, well, I can do you the honor of putting it on Zoom so you don't have to commute. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so you can do it from here. <laughs> yeah, like I did to you and right, right, making yeah. you come to Juni. Because it's, it's, it's a whole other issue on definition of the state and how the state can reinvigorate itself and its functions uh, to be able to organize a society in a whole different way than the way that we got used to for the last, at least, I say, 45 years, 50 years. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Ronnie. I, I really enjoyed this talk. And uh, hopefully we can always have people where we have our disagreements, but at least try to think with the same intention, which is the common good. I don't believe anyone... Uh, of us here has a hidden agenda we're trying to be as clear as possible the uh, conversation that lead nowhere are those where the one of both interlocutors have hidden agenda that they won't try to share the idea and try to reach any solution so I thank you so much for your presence here it's an honor Jad and I'll I'll add one thing Uh, I'm a big fan of independent media and during the protests I think a lot of us ended up looking at independent voices some of its obvious names like Megaphone, Daraj Media, they're yeah. now household names. But there are individuals that emerged as well as independent voices, and you're, you're among them. So I really commend anyone trying to push through in the independent media terrain and succeeding. And you've done really good work, and I'll, I'll say it. Thank Your you so documentary much. of Ziad Rahbeni, it's, it proves that you can disagree with a man's politics and still Fall in love with his music. Your your uh, appreciation for him showed in the documentary. And I think, if anything, it proves that you're a talented storyteller because you brought somebody who I don't know that well. You brought him into my world for over an hour and a half. I think it's one it's hour. one hour fifty, yeah. Hour and 50 it's a minutes, long one. But it went by quickly. And it reminded me a lot about him and why it's okay to disagree with his politics and love his music. Yeah, I truly appreciate it coming from you as a storyteller that I truly admire. And I like the subtitles too. <laughs> <laughs> There's Mark uh, Mark Hayek. I should comment on that. A good translator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chad.